This is Metrosource Minis, the official podcast of Metrosource Magazine and home of short-form interviews with your favorite personalities from the LGBTQ world and beyond. Quick, fun, and informative, it's Metrosource on the go. Out and proud since 1990. Well, hello, hello, hello. This is Metrosource Minis. I'm your host, Alexander Rodriguez, lead writer for Metrosource and avid podcaster, now, during COVID, there have been a number of amazing musicians that are keeping the music alive through live streams and new albums. And on this episode, we chat with jazz musician Dave Cause, who has single-handedly brought Saxy back. See what I did there? That's why I'm the lead writer. Okay. <laughs> In a recording career that spans nearly three decades, saxophonist Dave Cause has racked up an astoundingly impressive array of honors and achievements, nine Grammy nominations, 11 number one albums on Billboard's current contemporary jazz albums chart, numerous world tours, 13 sold out Dave Cause and Friends at Sea Cruises, performances for multiple U.S. presidents, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and appearances on a multitude of television shows, including Good Morning America, The View, The Tonight Show, Entertainment tonight and many more. Uh, a platinum selling artist, Dave is also known as a humanitarian entrepreneur, radio host, and instrumental music advocate. And during COVID, he released his 20th album, A New Day, exactly 30 years after his debut album came out. And he's been keeping the music alive with his live streams, including his most recent A Romantic Night In with Brian McKnight. Please welcome Mr. Dave Cause. <laughs> Nobody, I mean, Alex, with that introduction, what am I possibly going to say now? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, you're going to say plenty because uh, you are very popular. Um, and we joke about, you know, you're very popular with the moms and the grandmas, but, you know, the gays love you too. <laughs> well, and I love the gays. And yeah. I love the moms. And I love the grandmothers. I'm, a, I'm full of love, Alex. Yes. Yes, you are. And we saw that on a romantic night in, although a romantic night in with Brian McKnight, I expected you to be in bed with Brian McKnight having a romantic night, but it wasn't that kind of show. Well, I, I did. Um, I did suggest that to Brian um, and he didn't pick <laughs> me up on it. Uh, sadly. But I, I want to say that he, he got married. Um, I want to say maybe five years ago, he got uh, to his second wife and he did a soliloquy uh, to her before he sang one of his most famous songs. I can't remember whether it was back at one or, um, you know, uh, your my everything. What, one of those ones that's the classic Brian McKnight. And he did like probably at least four or five minutes on how he loves his wife and how before he's known, he's known so much as a, as a balladeer and a love song singer, but he said uh, uh, like he didn't even know what love was really about until he met this woman. And it was really just, it, it kind of melted me. And I was thinking about all these women on the, with their husbands on the sofa across yeah. the United States going, you know, why don't you ever say that to me? <laughs> or a single folk that were watching with like a box of chocolates and Postmates. That was happening too, <laughs> just, just so you know. It's like, that I want a Brian me. McKnight. <laughs> if I didn't do the live stream on Valentine's weekend, that would have been me too, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I want to talk about early Dave Cause. Now, we know you and the saxophone hand in hand. I mean, you're like the king or queen of the saxophone, but the saxophone was not your first instrument. Is that correct? No, I was a piano player first. Uh, I, when I say piano player, I means I took piano lessons. My mom yeah. forced me. I hated piano so much. And so I think I was, I started when I was six or seven and to rebel when I was around 10, I picked up the drums and uh, I was even worse on the drums. <laughs> and uh, it was, I, I can remember, I don't know if I told, told this story, I've told it a few times before, but my dad came to pick me up from a drum lesson and he happened to be uh, within earshot, uh, or I was in earshot, within earshot of uh, him talking to my teacher. And the teacher said, you know, I gotta, I gotta really break this down to you, Dr. Cos. It's just not gonna happen with Dave on the drums. He's just not, he doesn't got it. And I was crushed. And then, in, uh, so I didn't know what I was gonna do with this music thing. I tried it twice and failed miserably. And then when I turned 13, and this is what I tell uh, young kids or older people alike, like you, you have to, if you really love music and you wanna try playing an instrument, try a few and then, you know, see what, what really feels right and, and what works. For me, the third time was the charm. The third time was the saxophone. I picked it up the very first day in seventh grade and there was a different connection to that instrument and a connection that really, really worked. And the instrument became, I would have never known back then, Alex, that that instrument would become the primary relationship in my life, but I'm very grateful for it. I wonder what those early music teachers have to say, like when they see you nominated for Grammy after Grammy, it's like, but he can't play the drums. 
<laughs> well, I, I, I'm pretty sure that I would not have gotten the Grammy nomination by playing the drums. <laughs> the <piano. laughs> That'd be a whole different category. Um, by the way, but... I, should, I should tell you, just to set the record straight, I've been nominated a lot, but I've never won. So yeah, I, I know. Well, Susan Lucci. Uh, yes. Nine-time Grammy loser is the way I really refer to myself. <laughs> Us. Yeah, but you get to go to that party like nine times and you get to go to the after party. So, you know, be nominated. Uh, but, you know, the funny thing is, didn't you kind of create this category? Well, there was not. I play a kind of music that's sort of referred to as uh, smooth jazz because it was a sort of a radio format in the United States for a lot of years. Probably tw we had a good 20 year run. Still, there are some smooth jazz radio stations, but uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s, it was sort of unbeatable in, in uh, big cities across the country. And there, there was this kind of music that just where it didn't have a proper place. So none of us, none of us smooth jazz artists or contemporary jazz artists were really being recognized. And it kind of hurt. Every year those nominations come out and you go, OK, I, I guess I'll try next year. And so instead of being um, having a bad attitude and complaining, my mom taught me this well. She said, don't, don't complain, do something about it. And so I got together with uh, my business partner at the time and we wrote a, a proposal to the uh, Recording Academy who, who does all that and it got adopted. And the next year there was a pop instrumental category uh, released for the Grammys. And uh, amazingly that, that uh, very next year I got a nomination, it was my first nomination. So it wasn't as if we were getting snubbed by the Grammys, it's just there wasn't a place for us. Oh, and I kind of love that theme in so many different areas of life. If you know, if there's not a place for you, set set your own place at the table and enjoy the the banquet, so to speak. Um, I want to talk about recording your debut first album at Capitol Records. As we know, you know, Capitol Records is is just I iconic, and that word is thrown around so many times. But Capitol Records is iconic. What was that experience like? You know, breaking off on your own, being a solo artist, doing your first album in this building that has had legends literally record that must have come with some pressure i would imagine you have no idea the kind of pressure that that was uh i mean i just remember when i first got signed to capital and for those of you who don't live in los angeles maybe you've seen it on this very very uh, famous building it's a round building in uh, right there at hollywood and vine and i remember because i grew up in los angeles so i remember driving on the hollywood freeway and passing that tower. This was before I, I, I even made a record, um, but I knew that I was signed there. And I was like, I said to myself as I drove by, you know, somewhere in that building is a piece of paper with my name on it. It just was so, it blew wow. my mind so much that this, this actually happened. And then I do remember walking down that corridor to where there, there's very, very famous studios. There's the offices on top, but in the basement, there are these world-class studios that have uh, recorded, whether it's Nat King Cole or the Beatles or the Beach Boys, um, uh, Judy Frank Garland, Sinatra. I mean, it's Sinatra. I mean, you just, every single iconic artist has been in those studios. And when you walk down the corridor, Alex, there are pictures, black and white pictures of all these people, and they're staring at you. They're like this, you know, are you going to come with it? Because this is not... This is not funny business here. This is not children's business here. This you better be ready to make some history here when you record. And uh, so it's daunting to say the least, but it also was very inspiring because just being it's almost like hallowed ground when you're in those studios, realize what transpired in that exact same airspace. It um, it's humbling and inspiring at the same time. Well, and then looking back at that album, and then 30 years later, A New Day, uh, which is your latest album that you've given us, and it's the first time in 10 years that you've presented original music, and so there's this excitement, and there's this kind of circle of life, um, and it's like, oh, amazing array of musicians on the album, new music, uh, original music, uh, like I said, for the first time in 10 years, and then the 30th anniversary, it's like all this energy, and then uh, we're going to release it during COVID, and you guys recorded it during <laughs> yeah. COVID, it's like, wait, what? What? Yeah. That must have been uh, bittersweet, to say the least. How did you put this album together during COVID? You know, there was a very funny thing that happened, Alex. And I don't know if, you've, if you experienced it in your world, but in my world, everybody was sidelined. So uh, March of 2020, everybody who had any gig was like, the gigs are wiped off. You're sitting at home. Normally, you're on the road doing all these wonderful things, traveling, traveling to different countries and playing shows. Everybody's at home. 
And that actually worked to our advantage, believe it or not, because when I said, okay, it even started with the writing. Like I started to virtually write songs with my co-writers, some of whom are so busy that usually they don't have time to write. They were not busy during, because it was COVID. And then when we started to get uh, into the recording part, uh, because the technology is so the way it is now where everything is done, you can send a track to somebody and they do whatever they want on it and they send it back to you. That's how a lot of records are made now anyway. But everybody was home. So I could call these legends like David Sanborn, one of my all time saxophone idols and say, David, you, you want to play on this uh, album? You're my you're my sax hero. And I can't imagine this album without you. And he said, can you send it over today? He said, send it today. I, 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 everybody was really, really excited about rolling up their sleeves and getting involved with music because they were not doing anything else. Yeah. So, and then when you got the tracks back, there was a level of excitement and energy to them that really uh, separated it from other albums that I've made because there was that urgency of like, I really want to, you know, I have so much in me that's not coming out and I want to put it out there into this, whatever it was, this guitar part or a drum overdub or whatever it was, there was so much life in these uh, performances. And so when I listen back to that album, it's got all that. So I was really proud of that. And, you know, COVID has been very bittersweet for artists. Like you said, I've been able to talk to celebrities that I probably wouldn't talk to because they're busy, like you said, and people are at home. But we're able to have conversations within our community, within other communities. We're able to connect with somebody in some small town in Kansas City via Zoom. And we have the time and we, we are reflective right now. And we're kind of, I think, open to more conversations and to be more present. Um, and so that is, if there's any benefit of COVID, I would definitely say that that's it. But looking back at, at 30 years of work, multiple Grammy Awards, so many um, fun performances, your cruises, I mean, a, a, a walk, a star on the walk of fame. I mean, that's not too shabby. What memory really sticks out to you the most in your 30 years of album? <sighs> Well, I will say that since you brought up the, the Hollywood Walk of Fame star, that exists right out front of the front door of Capitol Records. And when I, I found out, um, you're not supposed to really find out until it's it's time, but I, I yeah. found out like a week before it was announced that I was going to get one. They announced that year's uh, star stars in one day. There's like usually maybe 15 or 20 of them. And I found out and I knew immediately that I wanted it. If I, if there's anything I could do to get it in front of Capitol Records, I mean, that's where Sinatra is and the Beatles are and Bonnie Raitt and Garth Brooks, I mean, and Natalie Cole and Nat King Cole. I mean, they're all right there. It's like, if you're going to have a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, that's where you want it. So I, uh, I called up my friends at Capitol and I went down there and I found the star that was empty and I, I, stood on it and I claimed it as mine. <laughs> of course, this is not how it works, right? Believe me, this is it's all about the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. But they got wind of this uh, from the person at Capitol Records that I went down there early and I found my star and they gave it to me. So go figure. That was in 2009. Um, I, I just, that day alone, and I've had some pretty amazing days, whether it was playing for uh, Obama. I was Obama's opening act one time. I played for Clinton as well. Um, but I think playing uh, and, and being a part of the Hollywood Walk of Fame ceremony with my whole family and all my friends and, and fans there as well. It's just, it was such a weird, surreal thing. And so often now, um, I'll go drive down there just to make sure that it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Did I dream that? It feels like somebody made a terrible mistake uh, giving me that thing. But um, so far, it's still there. And every time that I do go, Alex, I usually take some Windex. Some I was going to say, I would be polishing that every single day if it was yeah. mine. I would tell people, hey, don't step on me. <laughs> no. And the Grammys, we were joking about the Grammys. The Grammys are one thing, and that's a, a award from your peers. But... The fact that this thing exists in the sidewalk in Hollywood uh, and will be there hopefully for a for very, very long time, um, that's kind of like the best. If there was one award that I would say means the most, it's that one because it's 
it's about your whole career. It's not about one particular album or one particular performance. It really represents, and that's what actually the, the, the stipulations are not about what you've done or what you've achieved. It's really about what you do for the community yep. and uh, your giving back and your philanthropy and how you show up in the world. And Los Angeles, as I mentioned, I, I was born and raised in the Valley here. I love my town. I love my city and I'm very dedicated to, um, to keeping it, you know, the, the cultural hub that it has been for all these years and hopefully will be for many years in the future. Well, it does, ref it does reflect your full career and you've definitely made a name, uh, not only for yourself, but, f but for jazz. Um, and let's talk about your coming out. You came out in 2004, you know, in today's age, we think, oh, 2004 wasn't that far away. And right now we're enjoying this huge influx of entertainment personalities coming out. Um, but 2004 was still not this hugely open era. Uh, why come out? Well, I actually didn't, I didn't plan on doing it. It was a very strange thing how it happened. I had a, just, I'll tell you the brief story was, uh, I was promoting an album called Saxophonic. And uh, I had a friend who worked for another uh, gay magazine and said, um, I'd like to interview for, for, about the new album. I said, well, yeah, as long as we don't have to go to the, to the gay stuff, I'm happy to talk in about it. <laughs> in a gay magazine. In a gay magazine. He said, no, 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 the, the editors are cool. We'll just do it about the thing. And he wrote a beautiful article, gave it to the editors. And the editors, you know, it's not like I ever hid that I was gay. I was sort of yeah. out with friends and family, just not out professionally. And so they knew uh, that I was gay. And they said to my friend, he said, he, we know he's gay. This is a new policy. It's not like they made the policy right then. We have, If we know someone is gay, we have to ask them about that. That's our new policy. So he comes back hat in hand. He said, I'm so sorry, mm -hmm. but I have to do this. And I noticed the way that I felt in that moment, which was – Maybe this is okay. Maybe this is time. And so I talked to my managers. My managers uh, at the time were, were uh, representing uh, Melissa Etheridge. So they had a tremendous amount of experience in this exact department. And I came to them and, and they said, you have our full support, but if you're gonna do it, do it with the Advocate Magazine. That's sort of like the, the Time Magazine of the gay community at the time. I don't know if it still is, but um, and I, it's up I, there, you know, so are we. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I knew about Metro source back then, I would have done it with you guys, but I did do it and it came out. It was, um, a, a very lovely article. And within two weeks of that article coming out, I was in people magazines, 50 eligible bachelors or whatever that is. Um, I was playing for, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, the late Senator Kennedy, um, uh, for Democratic Senator Party in his backyard. I mean, it was just like the this thing. It was such a beautiful, once again, the experience of when you show up as your authentic self, as hard as that can be. Uh, believe me, I know that it's hard for, you know, that's that's a part of the human condition. It's not easy to show up as who you are. Uh, but when you do, there are just tremendous rewards that come with that. And this was a perfect example of that. And it was not possible until I hit that point where it was like, okay, this might be the time. A you know, week before, no. It's, so as I always am very sensitive and uh, to, to people's own coming out stories. You can't do it until you're just ready to do it. And then when you're ready, let's go. Yeah. Well, and being authentic to yourself, I mean, you know, we've talked about how you've kind of made a, a place for yourself, even your star. You're like, this is where my star is going to be. And like, this is a category that we're going to have for musicians like me. And you've done it. And it's really paved the way for people to come after you. Um, but when I think of jazz, I think of it as a very straight dominated genre. And I've seen you share the stage as the only white guy on stage. I've seen you as the only openly gay guy on stage. And like you hold your own, you're telling your story. Have you experienced any pushback from peers in your um, industry regarding your sexuality? There may have been some uh, kind of behind my back, uh, but I really don't know of any. And I think it's really about the quality of human beings that you work with. I will say something about the jazz community. It is very straight, you know, dominated by straight uh, men and women. Um, but I think jazz musicians in general are... Uh, pretty cool people. And I think if you show up and you've got the goods, then you, then you have no problem. Fred Hirsch is uh, uh, 
uh, openly gay, straight ahead jazz player out of New York. Um, there, there are a number of gay jazz musicians that are very successful and beloved. And so I think it really is, again, you know, that stuff shouldn't be part of the equation. In the, the world of music, if you have something to say and a, a, a pretty cool way of saying it, then you're going to get support. And I got nothing but beautiful support from my friends, from musical friends. And it just doesn't even come up. I mean, I, I'll joke about it occasionally, but it's just not even. And that's the way it should be. Your right. sexual pref preference, your sexual orientation is not your it's not something that uh, needs to be led with. It's it's sort of inconsequential to in the world of music, it's all about the music. I, I love that so much. You know, we we have been through an administration where we kind of did have to put our sexuality up front just to defend ourselves and people in our community. But I really do think the more we present ourselves as I'm this full person, I'm all of these things, the, the more we can build bridges and the faster we can build bridges from people that might not understand the LGBTQ community because we are so many things. You know, we're brothers, we're neighbors, we're your coworkers, we're, you know, we are all these other things. We're musicians. This is my passion. Um, and you know what, what you do in the bedroom, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, up, up to you now, but talking about Valentine's and talking about coming out, um, and you know, you have to know like people's comments and all that. Whenever you take the stage, it's like, Oh, there's Dave cause he's such a hot daddy. <laughs> you know that that's happening. Like that's, it's just happening. It's like, Oh, look at those pants. My goodness. Um, so you come out, um, but to the social media world, you've kind of led the single life. Is that true, Dave Cause? I have, I'm, I'm a single man. I haven't really, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a real relationship person or it hasn't been that way in, in the past. Yeah. I certainly keep that open. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't feel like any shortage of love. I've really had a, a wonderful, I feel very grateful for the life that I've been able to have. I've had a lot of love in it. Um, I'm, I love to date. Uh, and thank God that there are uh, people who, you know, uh, like people like me. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it hard to date, Dave Cos? It's hard to date in COVID. Yeah. It's hard to date in COVID because you're just worried, you know. There's a lot of really interesting parallels between COVID and HIV. I grew up with the, the threat of HIV always. Um, I graduated co uh, high school in 1981. So I was all of a sudden like becoming a, a, a man and wanting to experience everything. And then, okay, these are my desires. I want to do this. Oh, wait a minute. If I do that, and back then, this is a long time ago, back then, if you had sex with someone, you, you could die. I mean, it was really plain just that. So, and I don't mean to bring it down it, it, like that, but having felt that for so many years to get to a point where now um, having HIV is not a death sentence. And thankfully, I never got HIV. Um, and I take the... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Prep every day. And I kiss that pill every day because I think to myself, wow, like when in 1981 or 83 or whatever it was, the fact that I, one day there was this pill that if you're negative, you can take every day and you can keep negative for the rest of your life. I mean, it just it, it, astound, it astounds me. And COVID is really interesting now because everybody, it's not just gay people that are waking up and saying, you know, I want to make sure that I protect myself and I don't die from this. And if you're out there trying to meet people now, that's a, that's a real interesting intersection to cross and not easy. And you just have to plan it out well and talk and communication. I think communication in all personal relationships is so important and something that oftentimes we take for granted, but now more than ever, we need to do and make sure that we're really communicating with our partners. And I think COVID has kind of re-inspired the idea of communication, such as instead of texting you, I'll jump on Zoom and, you know, let, let's have happy hour, you know, let's let's communicate that way. And the thing about COVID, it's really put the nation on, on equal playing fields. It's not determined about how much money you have. It's not based on your sexuality. It's not based on your ethnicity. It's affecting us all as a nation. And so it has brought us together for the most part. We know that, you know, there's always, <laughs> there's always the other side, but I think communication 
um, especially with the younger generation, has kind of been re-inspired. And um, again, if that's a positive. I think it's great. I mean, I just did a uh, video with these young filmmakers uh, for a song on my album, and they they get out there. But I noticed that um, this is a young filmmaker named Ben, and uh, at, he's a straight kid. And at the bottom of his email uh, is, uh, you know, him, his, that, that thing, the pronouns that he chooses. And uh, that's kind of an interesting thing for a straight man to have that at the bottom of his email of every email that goes out. This is how I view myself and how I'd like to be referred to. And to me, every time I see that, and I, I'm starting to see that more often, it's like, I got no worries about the future because young people just, this is not what, what, what has tripped us up. And I'm not putting you in my, I know I'm a hell of a lot older than you, <laughs> but it's all filter. It's all filter. <laughs> send, it, send it over. Uh, but what it tripped us up of a certain age just does not even ping a younger person in their twenties, yeah. you know? And I, I think that that really bodes well for, our community and the world in general that we can be a lot kinder and of course look we're coming after four years of trump um i probably don't need to, to say here how i felt about the last four years uh, really just assaulted and and disgusted and fatigued beyond measure of just waking up every day for four years wondering what that person was going to do and i feel so much better now because uh, respect and dignity and and kindness and generosity of spirit they're back on the menu um and and it's just a it, i think that it bodes well for all of us i i totally agree um <clears throat> dave your album kind of touches on isolation uh you know during covid and um and your, your music video uh with brian mcknight um again was uh celebrating New York in a very unique way and that we saw New York totally stripped down. Uh, what is your mes message to the LGBTQ community uh, who may be feeling isolated right now d during COVID? What do you, you have said, to say? Well, you said it really great. And I think that because of the, the available technology that's here, and of course, like everything, there's two sides to the coin. Uh, it's social media can be very, very uh, denigrating too and very, uh, it can be crushing to the to the soul. I've, I've been there, uh, posting something, and someone c comes back and writes you something that just like wrecks your week. Um, but by the same token, the, the there's so many technologies now. I just learned a new social media thing uh, that's brand new called Clubhouse, which is sort of like live podcasting, for lack of a better term. Um, and I think that the the technology is yes. really helping us, especially during this time where we are not able to be in person as much as we'd like to, uh, to to keep that connectivity. We noticed it in in the live streams too, Alex. We did one for Valentine's, as you mentioned, and um, there was probably ten thousand people uh, watching that, uh, and which is mind boggling to me because I have a bit of an older audience, and yet they really figured out the tech figured out a way to get it on their computer or get it on their big screen. And they yeah. sat there at home and enjoyed a concert. And in many ways, I think that this is, this aspect will continue, even though uh, we know that there's going to be a time when our tours will resume and we'll be able to travel and people will be able to go to venues and enjoy that experience. Nothing will ever take that experience away, but there's this too, like you and I right now, mm -hmm. We, we can't be together, although I would like to have a cocktail with you at some point. I think we'd be dangerous. I think we would really, really, like, we would, like, drunk dial Nancy Sinatra or something. Like, Let's do it. Come on. Let's do it. What's your I favorite would, cocktail? What's, what cocktail do you like? Vodka and anything, but it, it's only vodka. Any other alcohol, and um, I'll end up in jail. <laughs> Was that gin? Gin? Uh, no, no. If, if I have anything else, I'll end up oh, in jail. Okay. Yeah. So no tequila, yeah. oh, no gin, just okay. vodka. vodka. Vodka it is. I make a very, very mean uh, vodka martini. Very. Oh, you're mean. on. You are on. I, I, I'm all for it. <laughs> yes, I, I recognize those motions from your stage while you're shaking that saxophone. <laughs> all right, Dave, are you ready to play a little rapid fire? Of course. It's okay. Worries if me. You were, okay. If you were to write a song for sax and Lady Gaga, what would the song be called? 
Um, it would be called in in the sacks of glory. Oh yes, love it. Done. Uh, what is a dating red flag that is an absolute no go for you? Uh, last minute cancellations. Mm, yeah. Yep, I hear you. Uh, guilty pleasure song on your playlist. Then you've got that yummy, 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 yum. You went right to that. <laughs> I love Bieber. I love. By the way, that that album, not uh, the new album is good too, but the that cha the album changes. It's got to be one of the greatest pop albums of all time. I love that album, every single song. And he's such a, uh, I mean, we think about that, that kid and what he's been, his life so far and yeah. what he's done. I have a lot of respect for what he's been able to, he's held it together. I mean, you know, not the best, but given the circumstances, I think he's done pretty well and he's very talented. Very. I have to sneeze. Achoo, excuse well, me. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what would the name of a musical based on your life be? <laughs> um the jewish sax player on the roof <laughs> all right <laughs> he doesn't have a uh, ring yeah yeah okay the worst funniest onstage mishap oh well i um i dropped my sa i was in front of ten thousand people or maybe even more opening up for barry manilow in chicago <laughs> and um so I had a, this was a few years ago and Barry's a good friend of mine. He asked me to open up for for him on a tour of the United States. So, you know, of course I jumped at the opportunity, but here I am in front of 10 or 15,000 screaming Barry Manilow fans, not happy to see me <laughs> at all. So, and it was just for 25 minutes. And uh, so I'm trying my best to make it happen, saying his name, Barry's coming out. He'll be out in just a second, but you know, He's not going to come out any sooner, so we might as well have a good time. And I get so into it. There's one time when I did one of these moves with the saxophone, my strap, because you, you hold the saxophone. Saxophone weighs like 15, 20 pounds. It's a heavy thing to be around your neck all the time. And I did one of these moves like this because I was so exuberant, you know, trying to corral the energy of these people. The sax fell off the, the uh, strap and flew 20 <laughs> feet across the stage. There was a hush over the crowd going, you know, and they thought, um, and I went to, to go get the saxophone. I was so scared because this was my baby, you know, 1963 Selmer Mark VI baby. And of course I looked at it and I knew that it wouldn't play. So I switched to the other saxophone, the alto that I had there, finished the song, finished the set. And then um, <clears throat> a few of my friends came back that were in Chicago for that show. They said, that sax stunt is brilliant. You, you do that every show, right? I said, no. My saxophone is going to go into emergency surgery <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's like that point in the rock star where they just smash their guitars. <laughs> yeah. You can't really do that with saxophones. They're too good. Dave, please tell everybody where you want them to find you and follow you. Uh, on Facebook, uh, Dave Cos Music at Dave Cos Music, and it's K-O-Z. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter there. On uh, Instagram, it's my full legal name. So uh, it's David Stephen with a P-H, Stephen Cos. And uh, DaveCos.com is my website where you can, if you lose track of any of that, you can find it, it all there at DaveCos.com. And it's a Alex, beautiful thank you website. so much for your, you guys are so great. I love talking with you. I'm going to hold you to that cocktail soon. Oh, you better believe it because it's going to be a night to remember. Like they're going to have to write like an HBO series based on that night. <laughs> <laughs> the night of. Yeah. Dave, it's always a pleasure uh, speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of COVID and I hope to see you in person real soon. Always a pleasure, buddy. Thank you so, so much. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that has been my chat with Dave Cos. You can read my in-depth interview with him in our current issue of Metrosource on newsstands across the nation or at metrosource.com. And that's our episode. I'm your host and lead writer for Metrosource magazine, Alexander Rodriguez. You can follow me on Instagram at Alexander is on air. Until next time, stay true and do you, boo.
That has been another Metrosource Mini. Like, share, and subscribe on your favorite podcast player and check out the latest issue of Metrosource Magazine on newsstands or online at metrosource.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram at Metrosource, and on Twitter at Metrosource Mag. Until next time, stay fabulous.